Hi there, my name's Steve Backley, and I'd like to, to uh, talk about career and, and, and take these questions that, um, that, that have come in thick and fast. So yeah, yeah let's, let, let's crack on. Um, so the first question is, why do you think that there's been such a dearth of British javelin throwers uh, this century uh, at elite level? Um, and it's a real tricky one because, you know, back in the day when I was competing, we had such strength in depth. In fact, in fact I'm pretty confident in saying it was our strongest event through the 90s. I think if you, from a point scoring point of view at major championships, um, you know, with myself and Mick Hill and Mark Robeson, um, Nigel Bevan, uh, Nick Neeland. Uh, I'm sure there should be others I, I, I've missed it just off the top of my head. Of course, there are many others. Dave Otley pre preceded us. And that's just on the men's side. And then, of course, Fatima and Tessa and then Goldie Sayers on the women's side and others. Um, so, yeah, we were very, very strong. Uh, and now we're not. So it's a good question. Um, and, it, and it's a tricky one to answer because it's a bit like, I suppose, what happened to middle distance after the, uh, the golden era, of, uh, you know, in the 80s or, you know, late 70s, early 80s um, or through the 80s. And, and that, you know, then hitting a, a downslide. And I suppose part of that is that this is cyclical. Athletics is an event or sorry, events within athletics tend to be kind of cyclical. They'll have it at times when they're strong and you get little hubs of, you know, athletes striving to be the best in Britain and, and in the proceed of them do, trying to do that become potentially the best in the world. I mean, that's the, that's kind of what happened in middle distance. That's what certainly what happened in javelin throwing, feeding off of each other. And, and it's almost, there, there becomes a perfect storm of then you get, you know, your great coaches come along and, and, and um, you know, or, or vice versa, a bit of a chicken and egg there, whichever comes first, don't know. <laughs> um, but, but essentially there is a perfect storm, great coaches, good infrastructure, there's a demand and a, and a desire rather from, you know, young, talented people and everyone begins to win and prosper. So, you know, the fact that that isn't there now is a tough one. And I, and I think a lot of that is, is the momentum stops for whatever reason. Um, and I think part of that was, you know, possibly due to, you know, a, 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 as much as it was an amazingly positive time, but 2012 and the and the focus and the attention that created and trying to d invent new systems, we, in, in my opinion, ignored what we did so well in the past. Uh, one thing I was particularly proud of is that there is a British way to do what we did in the javelin. Um, it was almost a bit of a blueprint. You know, I followed it from from Mick Hill, who preceded me, Dave Otley preceded him. And as I've mentioned, those names, Nick Leland, certainly a factor, uh, a good example, I should say, because, you know, we all had a style of doing the event that was slightly different to the rest of the world. The Germans are very, very strong. Um, for example, um, that the Finns are, you know, also, you know, come from a slightly different technical model. But again, you know, convert the gym very readily to, to, to throw in the javelin long way. And, jab, and and British way was to run at it. We started running at, the, at this thing and pulling the javelin a long way. And not only matched the Germans and the Finns, who were traditionally the best, but went past them. Um, and, and, and more often than not, were able to beat them. So there was a British way. But that was almost dismantled in the uh, aspirations to, to be even better um, through through 2012 and the and the, the you know the increased attention that that brought, so I think a lot of the knowledge and the the, the, the expertise that was in place was was pushed aside. Uh, unfortunately, um, that was the case, and, uh, and and that momentum was interrupted. And, and I think whenever you interrupt momentum in an event, it's very hard to to get that going again. Um, but that's where we are. Um, that's not to say that it can't start up again, you know, look at middle distance now, um, as, as an example of, you know, what was a bit of a lull after the, you know, the success of, of the co ovet cram, uh, and others that era middle distance took a, a bit of a, a lull through possibly you could say through the, through, you know, you know, the back in the nineties and early two thousands, it is now looking amazingly strong again. Uh, and it's a testament to the coach, the coaches, the infrastructure. So I said, then I suppose it begs the question, what do you need? Um, and, and, and of course, you, you need you need the raw material, you need the talent, um, you need the infrastructure. And, and by that, I, you know, I would involve in that the, the coaches, the facilities, you know, all the other stuff. Um, and you put those two together as a minimum. I mean, they're the basic ingredients with, you know, without those two, it's going nowhere. 
and, and it, you can start to turn that momentum around. And, and um, we have some of that. We have some great coaches in this country. Yes, we, we definitely you know, ha have those. Um, coordinating, putting a plan together, doing the basics well, um, you know, working together, sharing best practice, all that stuff that we know, um, you know, makes a difference. So I don't know if I've answered the question there, but um, I'll, I'll pause there and move on because I, I, it's one of those ones that we keep coming back to and scratching our heads as to why it's the case um but but you know it's a tricky one and and uh, you know I, I have aspirations to possibly help in that regard going forward you know i'm possibly of an age now where i can i can you know offer some advice and and, and help in some way so i uh, look forward to, to doing that so but moving on um so the next question is what needs to change to create the next generation of tessa fatima or myself and what would you do differently short and long term to encourage throwers as so few get funding. Mm. Uh, interesting to bring funding into the end of that question because the three examples there, of course, we were products of pre-funding. Um, funding, yes, it can help, of course, because you know a lot of the services have a have a, you know, a cost. Um, but in terms of what would you do differently, short and long term? Wow, it's it's certainly not a short term fix. I, 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 you know, of course, you know there are some quick fixes in terms of what you can do to get the best out of somebody but for you know to prosper and, and create that momentum again um it's more about i think putting you know the, the the basics in place again to have um you know the the, the coaches the infrastructure the talents the, the the performance pathways i think one of the big challenges you know it's a it's a cliched argument as well is that the raw talent is distracted by other opportunities you know big strong powerful guys certainly personally possibly girls as as well um you know have the challenge of being distracted by other sports that are very appealing uh rugby has a in particular has a um, you know a, a, a great brand at the moment and, a, and an appeal as a team sport um and the the athletics option is a is a tough one it's a tough one to um, you know, aspire to and, and you know, take this, you know, you, you're going to have this five-year journey, you're going to be predominantly on your own, you're going to be self-funded, um, you know, you're going to have to work your backside off and you might make it, you know, past, let's say, county level or, or you know, if you get to national level, wow, you know, how many people get to experience that? So then think about international level, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a tough sell. So, um, yeah, that's that's but that's what we're asking people to do. So it needs to be a you know a big carrot, a big appeal to to have that that kind of desire to do that. But that's what is required. Um, and and I hope what's going on in the event creates some appeal within the individuals, the youngsters who are maybe watching the the the, the champions that are being um, lauded on social media because that has the bigger bigger impact nowadays i get it um but you look at tokyo you look at the champion in tokyo on the men's side near as chopra from a country with no tradition with you know i remember throwing in in india in the late 80s and i got booed because i missed the pigeons in the infield you know, I was because I threw past the pigeons that had landed from the opening ceremony in the middle of the field. I always got booed. I thought, this British guy's rubbish. He can't even hit the pigeons. Um, you know, there was nothing. They didn't even get the event. It was about distance. Um, and now you've got this guy, Niraj Chopra, who's an absolute legend. I mean, he's gone for, he went from 3,000 Instagram followers to something like five and a half million um, in the weeks after the Tokyo Games, um, Olympic champion, and, and you know, and I would talk to him the other day, in fact, and he was telling me that you can't buy a javelin in India. You know, they're sold out. <laughs> like, how cool is that? Young kids are going to athletics clubs and they want to be the next Niras Chopra in a country with over a billion people. So, wow, you know, you don't know wow, where does where does that take us? Wow, how, how cool is that? How how, how inspirational is that? And it's, and it's real and it be, you know, and he's a great role model as well. So, you know, delighted to see that happening, slightly jealous. <laughs> of course, we would love to see that here in the UK, but um, yeah, um, what, what needs to change from our point of view? Well, look, we've had some role models in, 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 on the women's side and on the men's side. 
We've got the infrastructure. We've got the facilities way better than when I was coming through. Um, I think what we need is, to put it into one word, I think we need some glue. <laughs> and, and by that, I just mean we need something to pull resources together and have it all streamlined. That was why we were good through the 90s. I remember going to warm weather training camps and training alongside the other athletes aspiring to be the best in Britain, learning from each other, um, competing with each other and, and, you know, trees in the rainforest, you know, we were, we were edging upwards and trying to, you know, I remember, you know, overhead shot competitions with, um, you know, Nick Leland and Mark Robeson and Mick Hill and, 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 and others and, and, uh, and some of the other throwers and, and, you know, you know, they, I get beaten most of the time. That was fine, but I, I, I you know, it, it, it hurt me and I wanted to do something about it. So you come out the next day and you go away and train even harder. And, you know, that kind of, you know, healthy, competitive uh, environment was was alive in the in the nineties, certainly. And we'd go to warm weather training camps together, and we train alongside some of the best in the world as well. So you know, sharing best practice, it was it was immensely effective in that regard. Um, and it just it feels a little less glued together. Hence, I use that phrase, the, the glue that I believe would would help. Um, so moving on. What words or advice would I give to today's coaches and athletes in the javelin? Well, goodness, I've been putting some thoughts together, putting a book together recently on, on, on that, how to throw the javelin far. Um, and I've given it a lot of thought. So, so lot, lots of stuff going on in my brain to answer that question. The, the simple advice I would, I would give actually is to keep it really simple. Uh, my fir first javelin coach was actually my dad, who didn't know one end of the javelin from the other. And we were going, well, hang on. How, how does that even work? How can he coach you? But he did. Um, and he, and he, he kept it really simple. He, I remember vividly, he used to take a, a stick from the tree. He used to put it in the field, um, you know, just out of reach of what my best was, which was around 25 metres. I was, you know, when I literally just first started throwing the javelin, put it just out of reach and went, beat that. That was it. Genius. I mean, the best coaching principle that um, you know you could ever ever have in in terms of making a clear, uncluttered objective that I was in control of. I the onus was on me to find the way of getting past that stick. And when I got past it, he used to move it out of reach by you know half a length, half and half a meter. Um, and and we grew down the field. Um, and, and that mindset, almost of of just having that sort of growth mindset, you might hear that referred to as, as is now a very well founded principle in in personal development. Um, and th and then I got very fortunate to meet uh, you know a great technical coach, somebody, but also from that same methodology, a guy called John Trower, who was the glue in those days. By the way, just to mention that word again, he was very much the glue. He used to pull people together in terms of, you know, training groups and create this wonderful environment for us to, to train in. Um, so my advice would be to share best practice, be that glue if you can, um, and, and keep it simple. Um, there's only a few factors for javelin. There's the rhythm of the, of the event, and that applies to all athletics events, in my opinion. There's a rhythm to every athletics event. And when you find that rhythm that's right for you, you've, you've got that right. So you've got the rhythm. Range of movement is essential in javelin. We cannot get away from the fact that range of movement is, is, is so important because that's how we, we create speed um, and, and connection. And, and they might sound like quite strange words and they're not necessarily your classic. Um, so rhythm, range of movement, connection by that, I mean that forces are connected and so many athletes put hinges into their movement and do funky stuff. So keep it simple, get rid of the hinges, piking at the waist, shortening the arm, all that stuff that shortens our levers. Uh, so rhythm, range, connection and, and aggression is the fourth one I put in that. And by that, I mean your intent and how you sort of pull your energy to, to do what you're doing. Uh, and the more we increase that side of it, one of the others will break down the rhythm, the range or the connection. So four principles, they're my, that's my little kind of word of wisdom. Keep, keep those four factors in mind whenever you're doing your coaching or your training as an athlete. Um, and you won't go far wrong, in my opinion. Um, I think a lot of people get so bogged down in, in the nuances of the event when in reality, you know, there are many different ways to, to, to do what we do. And, you know, by obeying just the basics and, and keeping it simple, I think we can continue to grow 
uh, rather than rather than stop ourselves. Um, moving on. So how do I feel uh, from my transition from junior to senior? How did it go? And what would you say to kids progressing through that now? Um, I was super fortunate in this regard. I threw a world junior record when I was 19. I was European junior champion at 18, a world age best at 18. And, then it, and, I, and, I, and that was going super well. But then at 20, I broke the British senior record, went off to Loughborough University, um, continued to, to grow and thrive through a British all comers record. I remember my first competition ended up throwing 85 meters 90 and won the world cup which um was a was the only major championships on what major championships was the only what felt like a championships on offer that year um because you know it was 1989 so it was a year post olympic it was a year pre-european and commonwealth and in those days the world championships were only over four years so you had this kind of gap year which is where i had one of my best years how stupid was that um <laughs> So, um, but yeah, no regrets in, in that regard. But spent the year pretty much unbeaten. And I think that was the year of one world athlete of the year. Um, no, sorry, that was the following year. So the transition from that year to then being pretty much unbeaten and then being world athlete of the year, the following year, I mean, it was a, it was almost too good a transition. And by that, I, I suppose I'm alluding to the fact that <laughs> I then spent the next ten years trying to live up to those same levels of performance um you know and striving for that level which was the, the you know the very highest you know I, I, higher than i would ever have even dreamed of was uh was tough you know because of course it was you know i became the one that was being chased you know prior to that i went after the world record i broke that in 1990 you know, a year in, I was only a year into being a senior at that point, maybe 18 months into being a senior athlete, broke the world record. So you're kind of like, well, it doesn't get a lot better than that. Broke it again at Crystal Palace. Um, and then probably really started to learn the year after that because that was the first time I got injured. <laughs> and then you really start to learn. So, um, yeah, that was, that was, you know, a, a, a tough time. Um, but the advice I would say is, you know, Keep, keep the basics, um, you know, do those basics that we talk, that I talked about, but also retain, you know, I talk a lot about this sort of growth mindset. Um, that, you know, it's a very well-founded principle in performance, as, as I say, but it's a super important one for continued growth. And, and I think whenever there's a, that's, whenever the, the, the mindset stops growing, that's when we stop growing. You know, it's, it's almost like a given. You, As a teenager, you think, well, I'm going to improve. I'm a teenager. Of course, I'm going to improve. And if we retain that assumption, why, why shouldn't you improve in your 20s and continue to improve in your mid-20s? Why not? You know, that's the growth mindset rather than, right, I'm here if I can just stay healthy. And, you know, we, we, we almost pull the handbrake up and stand still. And that's when we stop improving. So, so, you know, have a look into this growth mindset stuff because it's super important and it, and it really challenges us, you know, to take control of that internal dialogue, all that stuff that we know is important in the soft skills. Um, but, but I would say that's probably one of the most uh, important, you know, not to be daunted by the senior ranks as you're coming out of the junior ranks. And I think even keeping a, a, you know, a, an eye on that when you get towards your 17, 18, 19, you know, we should, okay, aspire to success as a junior, but really, you know, that's when we should be ranking ourselves and looking at our strengths and weaknesses compared to the senior athletes, because so many athletes are, you know, can be not at their best necessarily in their late teens, early twenties, but you can be close to it. So um, yeah, hopefully that that's of some assistance. So yeah. Um, Next question. What was your favorite and least favorite training session? Oh, man. I, do you know, I loved change in training. I think that was my biggest challenge. You know, when if you had like a six week strength training block, I'd be two or three weeks in. You've made your big gains because the big gains come at the start of any, any block of work. And I think I always struggled to sort of, I, you know, I'd, I'd sort of start changing it around. But I suppose that my favorite training session without doubt would have been the technical sessions, the throwing sessions that were competitive um uh, you know i love those ones not that they were all competitive i love the ones that were competitive so we, you know when we're on training camp and you've had a you know a cheeky rest day just to be fresh for a a, a, a very sharp um technical throwing session 
oh, that was an exciting time because it was almost like comp time. You know, that was when you sort of, the juices are flowing and you start, you know, you know, tapping into the fruits of your labor in terms of the gains that you might have made through the early uh, early winter's work and, and so on. So I used to love those days because um, it was normally, that was it, that was the session for the day. And then we go and play golf. So that, that was my favorite day, a throwing session. And then the heart after the golf course, that was about as good as it ever got. And my least favorites, uh, do you know what? I, I, didn't, I didn't ever really dislike any of the work. Um, it was some pretty tough stuff. I suppose you could say, I remember some of the some of the stuff I did with Jan Zalesny back in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s in training camp. We were pulling sledges at an altitude, so 2,200 meter altitude training camp, pulling um, whatever it was, 30 kilos on a sledge for 50 meters and then 50 meters backwards. Heart, you know, jumping out your chest. Heart rate's probably about what, you know, over 200 beats a minute, absolutely in bits. But even those times I, I remember fondly because, you know, you finish those sessions, you, you feel you feel good about, you know, the fact you've loaded your gun um, in preparation for, for what's coming. So, so uh, yeah, no, that, that's, that's what springs to mind anyway. Um, next question was, uh, what is the pie charts practice schedule for an 85 meter man and a 63 meter woman? Kind of very specific. The pie chart practice session schedule, that is schedule, meaning the, um, I suppose that's, that could mean a number of things. So I'm going to go with um, the training schedule, the practice schedule that you would need. And I think I, I was always a little bit skeptical on this because I remember back in the day, some stuff came out of Eastern Europe saying that you had to snatch 125 kilos, you had to bench 180 kilos. You had to be able to, you know, I don't know, sprint under 10.6 or so. You know, it's like, I'm never going to do that. Really? You're crazy. Come on. You had to jump three metres 40 standing in long jump. That was the one I was remember thinking, what? What's that got to do with javelin throwing? Right. Um, so there was this sort of physical expectation. Do you know what? I'm going to answer that. How am I going to answer that? Okay, I've, 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 I've computed the question now. I don't think there is a pie chart. Make your own pie chart. Um, because, you know... There are so many ways of throwing the javelin. 85 metres for a man, 63 metres for a woman is the question. Make your own pie chart because you could have a guy. I mean, I threw 85 metres when I could snatch 80 kilos. I could bench press about 120 kilos. Um, I, could, I, I was reasonably quick on the sprint, but nothing hugely flash. I wasn't a very good jumper, particularly. Medicine ball stuff was good. Um, uh, and my range of movement was good. Flexibility was was probably my, my biggest asset. So I I definitely didn't fit the pie chart in terms of the physical attributes that were <laughs> dictated as the the, the 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 sort of the standards for an eighty five meter man. But I threw eighty five meters, um, and then I got to snatch I suppose one hundred and ten kilos and clean one hundred and fifty kilos and bench press one hundred and sixty kilos were about my very very best. But didn't throw that much further, not proportionately anyway. So what am I saying? Um, have your own pie chart. I tell you one thing I took time to do was look to what correlated for me and having uh, you know, all your data that you can collect from your sprints, your jumps, your flexibility, your coordination, your, your you know, reaction to pressure, you know, all those, maybe, whatever we can quantify, quantify it. And then year on year, look to see what correlates best to your performance. And, and then there's, you, there's your pie chart and, and, and don't be dictated to by others. That would be my, my sort of, um, my, my advice. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, I, I suppose a challenge because, you know, we all want to sort of have, you know, here's your blueprint, go away and do this and you come back and you've got 85 meters. So the one thing that correlates more than anything else to, to great competition throws is great practice throws. <laughs> and that might sound stupidly obvious, but, it's kind of true. And when I look back, the, my best years in competition, I have my best years in training. So what am I saying? Um, learn your event. I think that's the, that's, that's, the biggest, um, that, that's the biggest thing here. Learn your event, learn the skills, spend time with javelin in hand as a youngster and learn how to play the instrument, you know, in terms of, you know, that, that thing, that two and two and a half meters of, 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 
steel as it was in my days, carbon fiber as it is now, unless you can put that down, down the pipe, down the drain pipe without it touching the side, if you don't have the skill to release that thing through a dot in the sky, it is not going to fly. So there's a huge skill element to, to throw in the javelin that I was able to um, optimize and, and utilize to great, great effect for me because I could then not need to be as strong. And I used to love it at the championships if it was like a headwind and I could see the Germans and the Russians trying to like big muscles and they're cranking this thing and it's flying sideways and, it, and, I'd, go, and I'd just pop it through the sky and, and get it lined up and get it flying. Uh, possibly with, you know, eventually with similar speeds of release, but, but in the early days was able to beat people with uh, more power by, by learning to be skillful with the, with the javelin. And so that would be my advice to, to the youngsters is to spend more time um, learning your skill because then you can layer in strength. And I always find it so frustrating if somebody's gone ahead and got strong and got powerful and then they, then they kind of go, right, how do I throw this thing? you can't i don't i think that's almost impossible i think you're done you know unless you've learned it before you layer on your strength learn your sequence then um, and, and then it will be much more robust and it'll be you know much more you know second nature when you come to compete with it uh, hopefully hopefully that's helpful next, next question is um what was your initial reaction to Niraj chopra's olympic gold medal and how important can it be for the growth of athletics in india we sort of touched on this actually so my initial reaction was I was delighted uh, for him. Um, of course, Johannes Vetter came into the Tokyo Olympics as a massive favourite, but but we saw him um, starting to go off the boil. I mean, he threw he was just winning comps for fun, you know, week in week out, early season. But he came to Gateshead and he and he and he was slipping, and he I think he even blamed the surface, and there's nothing wrong with the surface. Um, and, I, and I, I feel that he's just, just missed timing his left foot. And when you've got so much power as he's got, amazing athlete, incredible specimen. When you miss time your left foot, it's not coming down as you want it to, you slip. And that's what was happening, in my opinion. Conversely, you had this guy, Chopra, who has historically thrown well under pressure. He's got a lovely repeatable technique. Great thing to have in your locker, by the way. That note take. Um, very repeatable technique that will stand strong under pressure. And actually, for me, it was no surprise um, that, that Chopra took the title. Maybe, you know, weeks prior, you might have said, well, Vetters can throw that sort of distance standing on his head. Um, but in the heat of the moment, and you're trying even harder, as we said earlier, you're trying to crank it to throw it out the stadium. Um, that's not the way to win championships. And Chopra kind of did exactly what I suppose I would have done and, and why I, I felt that, you know, that he had a really good chance. So um, hats off to him. Great to see the impact that he's had in India, the, the growing interest, him as a personality. He was on, he's on the, he's, you know, he's on the front of all the magazines. He's on the, the TV. He's, he's become a real, you know, overnight superstar. Um, and he's got the biggest prize in sport already. The challenge for him, of course, is, is now he's expected and in how he handles that going into, of course, Commonwealth Games um, to defend world championships. I mean, you know, you've got Julius Yego, who will give him a run for his money, possibly in Birmingham. And then, you know, the whole world, of course, for the for the for the champs in, in Oregon especially Johannes Vetter, who's the, who's the wounded, the wounded tiger that will be out to, to revenge what he thought might have been, um, what his, was his loss in, in Tokyo. So yeah, lots going on in the events um, and a great new role model. And I think it's, it's a real beautiful, diverse culture in the event. You know, you've got Julius Yego from Kenya, you got uh, Johannes Vetter from Germany. You got Niraj Chopra from India. You got Peters from Grenada. You have got um, you know Kishon Walcott won the 2012 Olympics uh, from Trinidad and Tobago. You know it's such a diverse event, um, and and you know I think I, I think I worked out the other day the last six global championships we've had champions from four different continents. And I, and I think that's it's pretty unrivaled as a, as the you know the the extreme diversity is is a, a wonderful thing to see and another example of the fact that there's no one way because completely different physical specimens 
You know, you've got Julius Yago is five foot nine and you've got, um, you know, maybe some athletes up towards, you know, six foot nine, potentially, you know, a whole foot of difference between the champions of our, of our events. So, um, you know, it's great to see it, it doing so well and in particular in India. So uh, moving on. So which of your many achievement, achievements do you consider the greatest uh, from your own career? Oh, do you know what? One of my... I suppose I, I'm not, I'm, I was going to say regret, but it's definitely not a regret. It's quite the opposite. I'm very proud to have sort of had a, a succession of great moments, but not one that really stands out um, from others. And some days I might say, oh, yeah, that first world record, that was a special moment when I reflect. Or another time I might think, you know, the Olympic record in Sydney was amazing, uh, but it only stood for 20 minutes. And then Jan Zalesny came along and snuck ahead and, and I ended up with a silver medal. Fine, you know, great moment, but, you know, a little bit of a uh, sting in the, the tail. Um, fourth European has, has to stand up there, an event that at the time was, was very much dominated by the Europeans. Um, you know, we mentioned the Germans, mentioned the Russians, Jan Zalesny, the Finns. You know, it was a, a very much a European event. So it was it was a, a huge uh, pleasure to retain that for the, the third time, having won the first title back in 1990 in split and then all the way through and to beat uh, Sergei Makarov, who was a bit of a beast in his, his own right, <laughs> a world champion, um, to, to beat him to take the title for the fourth time in Munich in 2002 was, was, was probably, that's the one I, I, I suppose from a personal point of view, from a, just that, you know, if you sit back and think about it, you kind of go, yeah, that was, that, that was pretty cool. Um, but, but actually having said that, the World Athlete of the Year thing um, was probably the moment that summed it up. Cause, and it was so by surprise, I remember being invited to, to Monte Carlo for the awards dinner by the IAAF and went down to, 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 to Monaco and expected to just sit and listen to some speeches and, uh, and, and see the athletes and, and, and sort of take it all in and whatever else. And it came to the, uh, <laughs> the presentation and I remember it was, was Saida Wita was in second place. And then it's, I, was thinking, oh, I was thinking, I wonder who's won it. This could be fun. You know, I looked around and my name was announced. I was genuinely, I, I didn't expect it. And, um, and, and uh, with reflection, that's that's obviously a huge honour to, to to have won that when you're voted from from people within the sport who obviously know what they're talking about. So um, that that was up there as well. So I've given more than one answer. So apologies, take your pick. <laughs> um, so next question. So uh, how does your commentary career relate to what you did in the field? And do you have a, an all time favourite moment behind the microphone? Um, Oh man, that's a tough one. <sighs> Lots of happy memories in terms of watching the sport from the best seat in the house. I mean, watching every event, watching, you know, the pole vault, the high jump. I love the sport. I love the field. I love the track as well. I mean, I, I actually you want to pick a track event and I'm going to say watching Usain Bolt, not, not necessarily when he was winning, when he was going through the rounds. I used to love watching Usain Bolt, um, in a, in a, you know, one of the early rounds of the 100 metres run 995, just strolling like he was just out for a, a Sunday morning jog. I just thought in, in terms of athleticism and, the, you know, the time he would do and the ease of which he would make it just, you know, un, 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 under the radar in many ways in terms of grandiose and celebrations, but just pure raw athleticism at sub-maximal, which just showed that potential. And, and then, and to be in the stadium to see his world record in, in Berlin um, was, was great to see the, the, the great man. Whenever he came into a stadium, it was electric and he'd be the, you know, the last to leave because he'd sign everyone's autograph and, he, and it, we were very fortunate to have him as a, as a real legend of our, of our sport. Moving on. So, um, what's the best way to make throwing events more attractive in the UK? Well, I suppose it's a, it's a tough one because making the event attractive, as we've seen from Nirash Chopra, winning's a great, you know, is, is, is a great um, yeah, magnet for attention. But 
um, there's a chicken and egg, isn't there? So going forward, you know, we, we of course we want future champions. Um, and maybe it's a way of seeing it more of a global event, you know, a global event, which it is. We talked about that, but having those role models outside of the UK and emulating them in a British fest. So, so uh, you know, I, I think the event is super attractive. I'm slightly biased. Um, I think it's it's you know, there's nothing more um, you know jaw dropping than seeing a, a, a you know. A, an 800 gram to two and a half meter, nearly three meter implement flying through the sky, almost the length of the infield, um, you know, coming out of your hand at 70 miles an hour. I mean, it's just, it, it's ridiculous. You know, I remember watching it for the first time and just being completely wowed. Um, and, and I hope that kids watching uh, feel similarly wowed because that has to be the, you know, that, that, that little spark of desire has to start somewhere. And, um, and I hope the likes of Niras Chopra, um, you know, the, 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 the games, the championships, you know, the Commonwealth Games next year in Birmingham it will be the spark for, for many. You know, that's, that's a given. That's how, it, that's how we roll. So um, I hope we've seen a bit of a, you know, we've seen the lull. And, you know, if it is cyclical, we, we can see some upside going forward because we, you know, we need to circle the wagons and, and create more glue and infrastructure that we talked about earlier. So, um, yeah, that hopefully will make it more attractive. Um, and, and the final question, how successful do you think you would have been in other throwing events? That is so easy to answer. I would have been rubbish. Nowhere near strong enough. Um, Javelin is quite unique, probably more like the jumps in some regards because you don't have to be as strong. I mean, when you can see, you know, the, the likes of Daniel Stahl, what he does with bench press, and you know, have a look on social media, it's ridiculous um you know the shot even more so the hammer forget it I, so so the other throwing events i had a go um and i could create a sequence but it wasn't going anywhere because the strength is is exceptional i mean it's not just at a high level it's at a ridiculous level so whilst i could just about get to an, an acceptable level of strength in javelin to you know which is a you know proportionally much much lighter implement it's the weight of a bag of sugar but it comes out your hands at 70 miles an hour. So there's a speed element to it with some strength, of course, fixing positions. Um, compare that to the forces of a two kilo discus hanging on the end of a, of a seven foot wingspan that some of these guys have got. It's a, it, you know, that's a different ask. So uh, yeah, glad I found my niche and uh, yeah, how successful would I have been? Not so much, but uh, yeah, it's a pleasure uh, sharing some thoughts. So, so thank you.